In my previous video, I came up with this simple VCA-based audio compressor. On that video, you left a ton of comments on how it could be improved, so I decided to do a follow-up video and address some of those suggestions. After sorting through everything, I ended up with this list of extra features. A gain reduction indicator that tells us whenever the compressor is active. A full wave rectifier that makes our peak detector more accurate. A switch that allows us to toggle between regular and snappy attack modes. A variable input gain stage that allows us to compress line level signals. And finally, a makeup gain stage to boost the output volume. Thankfully, none of these are particularly hard to implement. So let's start at the top and work our way down the list. First up, the gain reduction indicator. Here, some of you favored a full-on VU meter while others would have been perfectly happy with a simple LED. Now, because a proper analog VU meter is relatively expensive and bulky, I decided to go with the LED instead. The idea here is simple. We want that LED to light up once the compressor starts reducing the output volume. And ideally, the LED's brightness should be tied to the amount of gain reduction we apply. All right, but how do we know when the compressor is active? Simple, by looking at what's going on inside the VCA. As we discussed last time, that VCA works like this. The more current flows through the diode string, the more the volume of the input signal is reduced. And the amount of current flowing is directly determined by the voltage coming from the CV input buffer. So if we use that voltage to light up our LED, we should already get what we were looking for, right? Well, almost. There's two problems with this idea. First, a standard LED eats up much more current than an op-amp is spec to push out. And second, the voltages we apply to the diode string are not high enough to properly light up that LED anyways. So we'll need to amplify our op-amp's output somehow. Thankfully, we can do that really easily, using a standard NPN transistor and two resistors. If we set them up like this and connect the input node directly to the CV buffer's output, our LED will light up as intended. Here's how it works. Once the buffer voltage rises significantly above zero volts, a small current is pushed into the transistor's base, which in turn allows a much larger but proportional current to flow from the positive rail through the collector resistor, the LED, the transistor, and to ground. And while this mechanism would in principle work without the two resistors, we need the collector resistor to prevent the LED from burning up, and the base resistor to make the LED light up gradually, instead of having hard on-off states. Now, while we're looking at the VCA CV buffer, there are four small things I decided to adjust in retrospect. First, I bumped the current limiting resistor from 1k to 2k, simply to not stress the op-amp too much and prolong its lifespan a bit. Second, I pulled that resistor out of the feedback path. That's because under certain circumstances, having it inside can lead to unwanted oscillations, which would be particularly bad in this case, since we're so close to the output amplifier and inside a bigger feedback loop. Third, to really make sure the op-amp doesn't oscillate, I added a very small 680 picofarads capacitor between the op-amp's output and inverting input. Thanks a lot to Kyla and Carson from my Discord community for suggesting this safety measure. And finally, I removed one of the diodes from the feedback path. With three diodes in series, about half of the ratio knob's range was basically unusable because of intense distortion. The buffer was simply too sensitive to the incoming CV. By removing one of the diodes, we dial that back a bit, and so the distortion disappears. To see how all that works out in practice, I've already set the LED and its driver up on the breadboard, and implemented the changes to the CV buffer. Right now, the input doesn't cross the threshold, so the compressor is inactive and the LED is dark. But watch what happens as I move the threshold downwards. 
As expected, the LED gets brighter the more the compressor reduces the gain. And if I now turn up the ratio, we don't run into any ugly distortion at all. Alright, so that's the gain reduction indicator. The next item on our list needs a little bit of an introduction, because it's a pretty fundamental improvement to the way the compressor works. Remember how I decided to measure the output signal's volume by simply discarding its lower half? I did that based on the assumption that most audio signals are symmetrical, and so we wouldn't actually lose much information. As some of you have pointed out, this was kind of a cop-out though. Audio signals are probably asymmetrical more often than they are symmetrical. So my implementation does in fact lose plenty of information. How do we fix this? With something called a full wave rectifier. The idea here is this. What if instead of throwing away the waveform's lower half, we'd simply fold it upwards? Then our peak detector could read both sides of the waveform and react to any asymmetries. Cool idea in theory, but how do we pull this off? Well, there's a couple different ways to do it, but I decided to go for a rather simplistic approach, using only an op-amp, 200k resistors, and a diode. If we set them up like this, any signal we feed into the input will be folded upwards along the zero volts line. Here's how it works. If the input voltage goes positive, the op-amp will try to pull the voltage at the inverting input down to ground level. This won't work though, because the diode is blocking that. So ultimately, the output voltage will be identical to the input voltage, because no current is actually flowing through these resistors. This means that the upper part of our waveform will stay untouched. Once the input goes negative though, things get interesting. Because now, the op-amp will try to push the voltage at the inverting input up to ground level, and actually succeed. For that, it has to raise the voltage after the diode to the exact inverse of the input voltage. And that's because the two resistors now form a 50% voltage divider. So we'll only get 0 volts at the inverting input, if zero volts is the exact midpoint between the input voltage and the voltage after the diode. In effect, this means that the lower part of our waveform will be inverted. Great. There's just one downside to this setup. It will only work properly as long as we don't draw any current from the output node. That's because during the input signal's high phase, the output voltage will only be identical to the input if no current flows through the resistors. In our case, this is not an issue though, since the peak detector we'll be feeding is input buffered and doesn't draw any current from the rectifier. And here's how the rectifier's output looks like on the oscilloscope. As expected, all parts of the waveform below the zero volts line are folded upwards. Cool. Now, by feeding this output into our peak detector instead of the raw output, we should be able to catch any asymmetries. So that's the full wave rectifier. Next, let's look at the attack mode switch. As many of you have pointed out, this is an easy one. Remember how I decided to include the peak detector's attack potentiometer in the op-amps feedback path? I did that to make the attack sound a bit more snappy. But what if you encounter a situation where the regular behavior would actually sound better? In that case, you'd probably want to turn off the snappy behavior. For that, all we need to do is take the potentiometer out of the feedback loop. And we can do that with a simple SPDT switch. If we set it up like this, then flipping the switch puts the potentiometer either into or out of the feedback loop. And that's it. Now, while we're looking at the peak detector, there's another batch of minor improvements I decided to implement here. As someone mentioned in the comments, asking an op-amp to fill up a 10 microfarads capacitor is a pretty tall order, especially if there's little to no resistance in the charging path. This could stress the op-amp to the point of component failure, so I decided to go easy on it by shrinking the cap down to a more healthy 1.5 microfarads.
and by adding a small 200 ohms series resistor. Unfortunately, changing the cap size forced me to also adjust the values of the other resistors surrounding it. Otherwise, the attack and release times would get severely shortened. So I replaced the 100k attack port with a 500k, the 100k release port with a 1 meg, and the 4k7 baseline release resistor with a 100k. Also, I switched the 200k resistors at the next op amps input for two 470ks. That's because they ultimately lead to ground and provide another path for the capacitor to discharge through. You'll notice that these values aren't simply multiplied by 7 to exactly counteract the reduced capacitor size. Instead, I went by ear and settled on the values that sounded best to me. Because I don't have any switches that can be plugged into a breadboard, we'll have to test this by moving a jumper around. Here's how it sounds with Snappy Attack active. And here's without. Great, so that's the snappy attack switch. Next, let's move on to the variable input gain stage. Some of you have asked whether it's possible to compress line level signals with my design. Line level, if you don't know, is pretty low compared to Eurorack signal levels, which I've designed the original circuit for. And while you can compress quiet signals with it, dialing in the threshold you want would be pretty fiddly, since the threshold knob's range is specced for Eurorack levels. So what's the solution? Easy, blow up the input signal. Or in our case, don't cut it down so aggressively. Because as you might remember, we had to cut it down to prevent our VCA from distorting the signal. But if the input is very low in volume anyways, we don't have to cut it down as much. And because the amplifier on the other side of the VCA is tuned to restore the signal up to Eurorack levels, the input will leave the VCA louder than it actually entered. Now, to give us some flexibility, I decided to implement this using a potentiometer. If we set it up like this, the minimum setting will leave the input gain untouched and we can increase it from there by turning the knob. But before we select a value for that potentiometer, there's another small adjustment I decided to apply here. Some of you were concerned about the amount of distortion my VCA adds, even after scaling the input signal down. So I decided to play it really safe, and reduce the baseline input gain even further by exchanging the 14k resistor to ground here for a 10k. Of course, this forces us to increase the output gain by the same amount. With this in mind, we can pick a value for the potentiometer. A 20k seems like an okay choice to me, since it allows us to about triple the input gain. And here's how this pans out with a low level signal. Right now, the input gain is dialed all the way down, so the compressor only starts working once I max out the threshold knob. But if I turn that input gain up, the threshold knob becomes much more usable. Great, so we've made our way to the bottom of the list. There's only one more feature to implement, the makeup gain stage. What's it for? Simple. If you compress a signal, you turn the loud parts down to reduce its dynamic range. Because of this, the overall output volume is going to be lower. To compensate, most compressors include a makeup gain stage, which allows you to push the overall output volume back up. Implementing this is pretty straightforward. We just set up a non-inverting amplifier with variable gain and connect it to the compressor's output. Combining a 100k potentiometer with a 20k resistor to ground in the op -amps feedback path gives us a gain range of 1 to 6, which should be plenty. To test this out, we'll first dial in a very aggressive threshold and ratio. 
Next, let's counteract the loss of volume by turning up the makeup gain. And yeah, that works. Great. Though you might notice that the output is getting pretty noisy. This is the unfortunate side effect of amplification. It doesn't discriminate between signal and noise. In our particular case here though, we can pretty much ignore the noise, simply because it's coming from the breadboard itself. Breadboards, if you don't know, are notoriously bad when it comes to baseline noisiness. Once this circuit makes the jump to a PCB, things should sound a lot cleaner. To test this, I decided to send the circuit over to my friends at Erica Synths and asked them to turn it into a prototype module. They said, sure, but why don't we add a couple more LEDs? People love LEDs. And sent back schematics for a super simple LED-based VU meter. Since I liked this idea a lot, I decided to add it to my design. Of course, only after taking a closer look at how it works. Here's what I found. So first up, we've got an input stage consisting of two capacitors and two diodes. To be honest, I haven't seen this design pattern before, so I was initially pretty confused at what it does exactly. It becomes more clear if we think about the expected input though. A VU meter is supposed to visualize the volume of an audio signal. So it's safe to assume that the second diode and capacitor work as a peak detector. It's not immediately obvious, because the resistance to ground that a peak detector normally has is sort of hidden away. The voltage dividers on the right work double duty for that. Okay, but what about the other capacitor and diode? This is where it gets a little tricky. They're used to push the audio signal above the zero volts line, so that the peak detector can actually measure its volume top to bottom. Here's how it works. Let's imagine we isolate the sub-circuit and apply a simple square wave to the input node. During the wave's first low phase, current gets pulled out of the cap and flows into it on the other side. This will leave us with minus 2 volts on the left and about 0 volts on the right. Then when the input swings high, the charge on the other side has nowhere to go since the diode is blocking. Because of this, the absolute amount of voltage we add at the input is stacked on top of the zero volts on the right. So we'll read almost four volts there. And that's it. We've pushed the signal above the zero volts line. Now, if we reassemble the circuit, it still works roughly the same way. And so the peak detector gets to measure the signal's volume top to bottom. Its output is then used to feed four LED drivers, very similar to the one we set up earlier for the gain reduction indicator. The kicker here are the four voltage dividers before those, though. Since their divide-down ratios ramp up almost exponentially, the diode at the top will light up at much lower voltages than the one at the bottom. In this way, the louder the input signal, the more LEDs light up in total. And that's all there is to this super simple VU meter. Now, since we already have an indicator for the amount of gain reduction we apply, Erica and I decided that it would make the most sense to use the VU meter for visualizing the compressor's output volume. Next, I had to play the waiting game, as they converted the schematics into a PCB layout and got a couple prototypes manufactured. Fast forward to a couple weeks later, and I found this in my mailbox. All the features we added are here. The VU meter and gain reduction indicator, the input and makeup gain controls, and the snappy attack switch. Great. So let's put this thing together. The PCB is pretty crowded and a little tricky to populate, but I guess this is okay, since the kit is meant as an extension to the more beginner-friendly original lineup. My soldering skills got a little rusty, and so did the pads on the PCB, apparently. I had to bump up the temperature considerably to get solid joints. Lucky for us that this is just a prototype. Alright, all done. Let's see how our circuit works as a proper module. First up, Let's feed it a bead from my 606 drum machine. This should probably work best, since it's what I used as a reference input when designing the circuit. <laughs> 
sounds pretty good to me. The VU-meter in combination with the gain reduction indicator is really helpful when adjusting threshold and ratio. To prove my earlier assumption, let's really push both ratio and threshold, and then counteract the loss of volume with the makeup gain knob. While there is definitely a little noise added on top of the signal, it's much less noticeable than on the breadboard. Great. Next, let's compress a beat coming from a 909 type drum machine. The individual 909 voices generally have much longer tails, so you really have to play with attack and release to get it to sound good. Finally, let's see how the circuit does with a reverb drenched synth arpeggio. Since I'm pretty happy with how this sounds, I decided to give Erica Synths the go-ahead for adding the compressor to our lineup of DIY kits. They got to work, and put the whole thing together already. So if you're interested in getting one, the kit is now available in Erica's webshop, and will come to other retailers very soon. You can find a couple links in the description. And that's all I have for this video. If you've enjoyed it, consider supporting me on Patreon. I've recently added a couple live streams on drum machine circuit design to the archive there, which you can only access as a patron. Anyways, thanks for watching and until next time. See ya!